Then I looked, and behold, above me in the expanse that was over the heads of all the cherubim, something like a sapphire stone in appearance, resembling a mighty throne, appeared above them. And he spoke to the man clothed in linen, and he said, Enter between the whirling wheels under the cherubim, and fill your hands with coals from fire between the cherubim, and scatter them over the city. And he entered in my very sight. Now the cherubim were standing on the right side of the temple when the man entered, and a cloud filled the inner court. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub <coughs> to the threshold of the temple. And the temple was filled with the cloud, and the court was filled with the brightness and of the glory of God. And moreover, the sound of the wings of the cherubim were heard as far as the outer court, like the voice of God Almighty when he speaks. And it came about when he commanded the man clothed in linen, saying, Take fire from between the whirling wheels. From between the cherubim he entered and stood beside a wheel. And the cherubim stretched out his hand from between the cherubim. Uh, and the cherub stretched out his hand from between the cherubim and he to the fire which had been between the cherubim, took some and put it into the hands of the one clothed in linen. And he took it and went out. And the cherubim appeared to have uh, the form of a man's hand under their wings. Then I looked, and before, behold, four wheels beside the cherubim, one wheel beside each cherub, and the appearance of the wheels was like that of the gleam of a tarnished stone, a tarshish stone. And as for their appearance, all four of them had the likeness as if one wheel were within another wheel, and they moved and they went in any of the four directions without turning as they went. But they followed in the direction which they faced without turning as they went. And their whole body, their backs, their hands, their wings, and the wheels were full of eyes all around, and the wheels belonging to the four of them. The wheels were called in my hearing the whirling wheels, and each one had four faces. And the first face was that of a cherub, the second face was that of a man, and the third face was that of a lion, and the fourth face was that of an eagle. And the cherubs rose up, and they are living beings that I saw by the river Shebar. Now when the cherubim moved, the wheels would go beside them. Also, when the cherubim lifted their wings to rise from the ground, the wheels would not turn from beside them. And the cherubim stood still, and the wheels which would stand still. And when they rose up, the wheels would rise with them. And the spirit of the living beings was in them. Then the glory of the Lord departed from the threshold of the temple and stood over the cherubim. Now when the cherubim departed, they lifted their wings and rose up from the earth in my very sight with the wheels beside them. And they stood still at the entrance of the east gate of the Lord's house. And the glory of the Lord God of Israel hovered over them. Thus, these, being, these are the living beings which I saw beneath the God of Israel by the river Shebar. So I knew that they were cherubim. Each one had four faces and each one four wings, and beneath their wings was the form of human hands. As for the likeness of their faces, they were the same faces whose appearance I had seen by the river Shebar, and each one went straight ahead. Ooh. Now that's creepy. <laughs> oh! There were too many carabines. The, the, the holy markers. What's that, honey? The carabines in there kind of makes it a little bit more playful. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's an engineer I've told you over at NASA that believes what he was witnessing was a spaceship, not the Lord God. And they have even, or this guy, I forget his name, but he wrote a book called The Spaceships of Ezekiel. And uh, I read it a hundred years ago. It's uh, weird. But anyway, uh, he, was, he designed a spacecraft that looked just like that and uh, said, yes, this is what Ezekiel was seeing, an extraterrestrial landing on Earth. And, um, which is kind of okay, I guess. 
uh, know that it's too much theology. Anyone who asks, hmm? anyone who takes away. Well, no, he's just trying to understand. I don't think I trust. Have you ever heard me preach? I had stuff all the time. I have a note. As long as you got a note, you're okay. I learned that from the nuns. <laughs> anyway, uh, what do you think about this chapter? You know, there's, it's interesting because one minute, it's an interesting thing. Um, the problem with Hebrew is they don't often have uh, tents like we have tents. You know, I could say, Barbara, I'm looking at you. And your hair looks marvelous. Right? And you know that we are in the present, correct? Right. How about if I came and said, Barbara, I looked at you yesterday and your hair was a mess. <laughs> but now it looks perfect. What did you do? Well, you, obviously, I am referencing a past event. I looked at you. You know, and then you can throw in all kinds of participles. Well, last week I was looking at you, and, which denotes not only past tense, but personal reference and all this other stuff. Well, see, Hebrew doesn't have that. There's no such thing as it. Uh, there is first, second, and third person, but tense is often very difficult to determine in Hebraic poetry. So, when he's talking, the only reason we, any way we have anything is two things. First of all, if you remember, last week, or was it our last time we met, two weeks ago, the river Shebar is over here in Egypt, I mean uh, Babylon, it's a little tiny tributary to the great Euphrates is what it is. And out here in the wilderness, this is where God and Ezekiel started their lesson. But if you remember two weeks ago, God brought Ezekiel back to the temple here in Jerusalem. It's 6,000 miles away to show him uh, why all of this destruction fell upon them. Remember? And not only did he bring him uh, geographically 6,000 miles back to Jerusalem, but he also took him back in time. Because now Ezekiel is, is a grown-up man, not a little boy, when he was taken. Uh, the calamity that befell Jerusalem is over. So now he's got to take him back before the calamity and, tell him, and show him exactly what befell them so that he will know and he can teach his people. So we're transversing not only physical space, but time as well. Uh, which is pretty incredible when you think about it because we humans cannot do that. I can't go back in, in, in time. If I could, I wouldn't because I've been there. <laughs> we can't go back in time and we can transverse uh, or traverse distances, but even then we need an airplane or a car or some mechanism by which that happens. As far as Ezekiel goes, he never got on board any of those wheels or turning wheels or nothing. He just saw them. So obviously he was transported back here somehow without the use of vehicles. Now some theologians will say, well that was just because he was in a dreamlike state or a vision state. He didn't really go back. But then again, you have to explain all the verses in the last chapter that where God said, reach out, take this stone, reach out, do this, do that, do that. Well, he couldn't have done that back there in a dream or a vision. He would have had to have been on site of the destruction of the temple. So there's this argument both ways, whether this was a vision, whether it was an actual event, whether God actually did take him back in time and space to put him there, or was it just a, a, a dream that he had and God used that dream to uh, teach him what he needed to know? Well, the answer to that question is simple. Yes. Okay, we're done with that. No, <laughs> what I mean is that God uses dreams. Of course he uses dreams. Who had a great dream? Joseph. 
saved Mary and the baby. Why? Because in his dream, the angel said, Joseph, get up and get the heck out of here. Soldiers are coming to kill Jesus. And he got up immediately and he took off for Egypt. So, does God use dreams? Of course he does. Does God use visions all over the place? There's visions of this or visions of that. And men are instructed by these visions as to what to do for God or what not to do for God. Uh, so he uses visions, he uses dreams, but he also moves people from place to place. That's also a common occurrence throughout the scriptures and great miracle along the way and all kinds of things that he's shown his people from day one. So when you try to sit down and definitively interpret exactly what Ezekiel is, what's happening here, you're going to have some problems. And your first two problems is going to be time and space. How can you do that? Because one minute he's talking about the Lord be, flew above us and he came down and there was cherubims and wheels and all this other stuff rolling around. And the angels were there, and these angels were there with the wings, and there was fire underneath. Sounds like a spaceship, doesn't it? And I saw him, and I beheld his glory, and smoke rose up. Yeah, you think so? You blast off a rocket, what do you have? A bunch of smoke, that's for sure. Uh, is there spaceships? Is he witnessing a craft coming down? Or is it just God as doing the same thing, by the way, that he did, when, he, when Solomon finished the temple and dedicated it to the Lord. Remember when the Lord entered the temple at Jerusalem before they got all nasty? Yeah, verse 4 says he entered the temple. He entered the temple in a great cloud of smoke and the angels were there, the cherubim and the seraphim and the wings and the eyeballls everywhere and all that stuff. Same stuff. It's the glory departed from the temple. Okay, here's another problem. He's writing this or saying this as if it's happening in Shebar. But then he says he's watching it happen at the temple. He's watching the glory of the Lord. And when, when they got all corrupt and God finally pronounced the final damnation upon the temple, his glory rose. Same thing. And that cherubim and the seraphim were flying and all that stuff. And God went through the east gate of the city and gone and said, you know, the next time I return, you're going to wish I did. And uh, so what's happening here or what's happening over there is the same thing that's happening here. And somehow Ezekiel is witnessing both of them. He's witnessing both of them the first time it happened. And now... The, re the, the, the video of it, the recap of what's happening. This happened when he was a small child, probably didn't understand it. Now he's a man. And God is saying, sit down, I need to teach you this. This is why the city was destroyed, the nation was destroyed. This is why the people are uh, six million miles away in slavery and captivity, and all the other ones are dead and left behind to rot. I want to tell you exactly why these people perished, even though they're my people, my children, my chosen ones. Now, folks, remember, this isn't the first time this has happened. It happened in the wilderness. Remember when they were coming to this land in the first place? None of them made it. Only two guys, Caleb and Joshua. That means 649,998 didn't make it. Only two did. And again, God took all the people that were about 16 and under, sat them down on the thing and said, boys and girls, now you're older. You've grown up a little, wandering 40 years in the wilderness. You're all men. Sit down, shut up, and listen. And we have the whole book of Deuteronomy because of that. Deuteronomy is a retelling of the law. Leviticus was the law. That was given at Mount Coral. Uh, way down here when they came out of Egypt they didn't listen then they all perished in the wilderness they didn't listen now and they all perished in Israel same thing human nature rarely changes do you know what's the same yesterday as it is today 
lots of stuff, pain. If I hurt yesterday and I hurt just as bad today, what's different about that? 24 hours? Yeah, that means nothing. I'm still hurting, my arm's still broken, my head is still bleeding. Disappointment, abandonment. You know, I talk to people a lot whose spouses leave them and they come in and say, oh, Tom, what did I do? And they hurt terribly when it happens. And you know what? Five years later on their anniversary, they're still hurt. What's different? The passing of five years? No untruer statement was ever made than the guy who said, time heals all wounds. No, it doesn't. Some wounds are just too deep. Didn't you watch Frodo and the Lord of the Rings? Some wounds just can't heal. Remember when he got on the boat and went off to die? See, that was truer than the old adage, time heals all wounds. Not necessarily. Some wounds have to be bore for what they are. People running around this nation, tearing down Confederate statues, tearing down Confederate flags. You know, is that going to change what happened in 1865? The men that died on the Confederate side are still going to be dead. You can dig up their grave markers, you can tear down their flags, you can destroy their monuments, but they're still going to be dead. They fought, they believed in what they thought was a good thing to do. They lost. And now this new millennial generation comes along and says, well, that's my families. We'll just erase history and, it, and it'll be okay. It's not going to be okay. It'll never change. This is what happened here. Man turned away from God. Man turned away from God down here in when they came out of Egypt, he turned away from God here. He would do it during the judges. He would do it during the, uh, even the Roman occupation. When Jesus got so frustrated with the priests in uh, Matthew 23, chapter 23, and he calls them blind guides and hypocrites and fools. Even though the Bible says, call no man a fool, Jesus called everybody a fool. Of course, he's God. He, he, he can do that. We can't, but he can. And he said, you, you, you glory in your buildings. You glory in the strength and size of this temple. And it was huge. It was the biggest building on the planet at that time. Biggest structure man had built. Even higher and more space, larger than the pyramids of Giza. And Jesus looked at him and said, you are really aggravating God in a way you have no idea. That's what he talks about. You know where your heart is? What you treasure the most, that's where I'll find your heart. And if you treasure God and make Him a priority, I'll find your heart there in the hands of God. But if not, then I say, woe be unto you whose life has been spent in foolishness. Not one stone shall lay upon another. You see these great buildings? Not one stone will lay upon another. Well, what happened in 55 AD? Roughly 20 years after Christ came and went. Or 30 years. Rome destroyed it. They slaughtered the people. The few that ran away ran down here to Mutsala. Or Mosada, some people pronounce it. They went up on the hill and they fought the Romans for three years or outlasted them for three years and they all ended up committing suicide rather than be taken prisoner by the Romans. The Romans were going to part them all by that time. They said these little peasant people have put up one heck of a fight. But uh, they said we're not going. You know to this day that when you turn 16 in Israel, whether you're a male or female makes no difference. Every 16-year-old person in Israel has to join the army for a minimum of two years. They take training, they take gun training, they take shooting, ordnance, bombs, rockets, everything. They learn how to be soldiers. Men and women make no difference. And when they graduate, 
The first six months is spent in intensive training, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, everything. They take them up to the top of Masada, Mutsara, and they gather them around and they do this ceremony, a graduation ceremony, whereby the 170 or 100, 270, whatever was up there, that all killed themselves in that stuff rather than be taken prisoner by the Romans. And they make each one swear on the Torah, on the scrolls, that this Musada will never happen again in Israel. Ever. You will fight to the death, not run away and hide. Every kid has to do that. Every kid has to be a soldier. <clears throat> Man, and we look at our little American wimpy kids that, oh, well, mommy didn't put a Twinkie in my lunch today. I hope they didn't ruin it all. Jesus, God, you Give me a break. These kids are over there learning how to use rocket propelled grenades. And she's a 16 year old girl, you know? How to defend their country because Israel is surrounded by enemies on every side that hate them. Rockets flying into Israel, daily occurrence. There ain't no safe spaces in Israel. That's the difference. Well, where did the why, how, what made the Israelites so tenacious like that? Where'd they get that? Well, studying their own history. What they did, what they failed to do. And in the end, they ran away as cowards and hid on top of a mountain never again. And they are dead set against that. And if you, did, you say, well, I don't want to go in the army then you go to jail. Or you're banned, you're thrown out of Israel forever. Say goodbye to everything you've ever known, you're done. The last thing we need is a fainting heart. We need faithful hearts. Well, you know what, where'd they get that? Their own history, right here. Right here. Right here. That's where they got it. And throw, go ahead and throw Rome in there as well. When they came and destroyed it again. Maybe it's really is finally learning. What it means to be faithful. Not just in one thing, but everything. Faithful in God. Faithful to country. Faithful to family. Faithful to spouses. Faithful to families. You know, more people have faith in an NFL football team than they have in their own family. Can you imagine that? A woman gives her life to a man for 40 years, 50 years, doing everything for him, making his life wonderful, and he cares more about the Green Bay Packers, which he's never even been to before, Green Bay, than he does his wife. You say, Tom, that's not true. Oh, it is. It is true. Sadly, it's true. He cares more about his football game or his Sunday afternoon. You know, I know a few people in this church that are not here and won't be for the next 16 weeks or whatever. Because they got to get a good place in the bar for the football games. How are those football games going to really impact or change your life? I mean, you don't play for them. You've never been to the city. If they win, your life doesn't change. If they lose, your life doesn't change. Unless you bet all your money on them. That's, that could change things, I guess. That doesn't really change your life. That just changes your circumstance. You know, you once had money and now you don't. It doesn't change your life. It just changes your circumstance. You are still who you are. And who are you? Well, you're very unfaithful to your family. You're unfaithful to your Lord. You're unfaithful to your community. In fact, you ought to go up here on top of this mountain and just wait three years and eventually see yourself as worthless to where you kill yourself in some noble act of will never be taken prisoner. Well, you're not really accomplishing much up on top of that hill, are you? 
See, everybody makes this a holy site. It wasn't a holy site. It was a sad ending to a rather miserable existence is what it was. They knew God was against them when they saw the temple and the city burning. They knew God was against them when the great edifice of Herod came down, not one stone upon another, just like Jesus said it would happen. Well, you've got to scratch your head at that a minute and say, well, maybe, maybe he was right. You think? But the amazing thing about Jesus being right is he was right here, too. He was right here. Get right down here. Now remember, these aren't godless enemies, or are they? They were the Lord's chosen people. Or were they? This chapter speaks of one word. This is the single attribute that God blesses throughout the entire scripture. He doesn't bless people who are strong and mighty. He doesn't bless women who are gorgeous and beautiful. He doesn't bless young men who are talented and can run a million miles an hour. He doesn't bless those who are rich and successful those who are educated and have degrees all over the world. Who does he bless? Those who are found faithful. Every parable in the Bible speaks about faithfulness, if you really want to stretch some of them. God blesses those who are faithful to him. And he curses those who are not. Question. How do we prove ourselves faithful? This big ocean between us called time. You cannot prove yourself faithful by any other means except time. You marry Evelyn, go out to marry Tim, and Tim and Chuck say, I will love you forever. The day you got married. And you guys are smiling because you really look good. But how do you know he's going to love you forever? Fact of the matter is, you do not. You have given her no evidence whatsoever to make the Racha believe that you're going to love her forever. Chuck, you've given Evelyn no evidence whatsoever that can make her believe that you're going to love her forever. It's kind of like what we call blind faith, isn't it? Oh, we love to hear that stuff. I'm going to love you forever, dear. Yeah, right. Oh, that's my man. But what if he doesn't? What if, you know, three months into the marriage, he's seeing somebody else? Or six years into the marriage? See, the only way you can prove yourself faithful is what? Time. That goes for us with our spouses. That goes with us with our God, with our Lord. Yeah, you go to a camp, Bible camp somewhere, give your life to Jesus Christ, cry a little bit, throw yourself at the altar. And then a few years pass. You go from 10 years old to 17 years old. You're out with the boys raising hell. And the last place on earth you want to be is in church. The last name you want to mention in the midst of your group is Jesus. Then God shows him and says, listen, I, I came to get all of those who are mine. And take them home into glory. Would you go? Were you faithful? Jesus said, I know mine and they know me. Well, 
folks, that's what this chapter is all about. Trying to teach Ezekiel the most vital attribute in the world. And so far, the Israelites had failed miserably at it. I swear by all that is holy, I stood right there in the altar in front of Carol and swore I'd love her my whole life, no matter what. And she heard it, and she went, oh, that's so wonderful. But at that point, had I given her any evidence as to that? None whatsoever. Nothing. Now, 41 years later, when this woman, who's not quite the way she was then, got a little, you know, crust on her now, a little aged. Don't tell her I said that. She wakes up in the morning, you know, looking like one of those Japanese Godzilla movies. And I look over and say, I would love you forever. Now she has to read now she has reason to believe I'm making that stuff up. <laughs> of course I don't look much better, my hair's sticking straight up and all that. She goes, Do you know how ugly you are in the morning? It takes all night to get like this. I work at it. But after 41 years of marriage, does she need to worry? Not so much. Especially not with all she makes and I get to live. <laughs> I get to live in a lifestyle to which I have become accustomed. But I can say that now with a little bit more integrity than I did 41 years ago. And the only thing I have to thank for that, well, to God, first of all, because I made my promise to Him, I'm not bringing that. But secondly, I have this to thank. Time we all see as a curse, right? The great, the great reaper chasing us down. When you're young, he's way, way back. And as you get older, he's getting closer, he's getting closer, he's getting closer. And it's a foot race to the grave, you know? And we're always trying to outrun time. We hate time. Well, that's one way to look at time, isn't it? Another way to look at time is that's what a gift, that's a gift God gives you to prove yourself a faithful woman to your husband, to your church, to your Lord, to your community. You know, we give prizes out to people like that. You know, oh, man of the year, woman of the year. What determines that? Well, she's been a faithful servant of this courthouse for 74 years. Hmm. She deserves an award, right? Why? Because she's been... How about that teacher that's taught in this little school for 100 years? Or that volunteer that's helped in the school for 65 years? The PTA says we need to give her a life award. A life award? Wow. Why didn't you give it to her back when she was 14? Because she hadn't done anything at 14, right? But now at 94, that's another way to look at time. Not as something out to get you, to curse you, to kill you, to end you, but see it as something to help prove that you are a man or woman of integrity and grace and truthfulness and most importantly you are a faithful person look at the four faces of four animals what do you have you got a little baby a cherub that's what cherubs are a little baby angel cool. then you have the face of a man Right? Then what do you got? A lion. Who is a lion? The reference is, of course, to Jesus Christ. But the other reference is to one who believes in Jesus Christ. And he shall go forth as a lion. Strength, power, ability. And then lastly, what do you got? 
wings an eagle and he shall mount up as wings of eagle or eagles over 2,000 references of the Bible of the glorification of man with his God his Lord the birth the growth the purpose the reward Faithfulness, 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 and even at a tiny age, faithfulness. Gee, I wonder what God's trying to teach Ezekiel in this chapter. What's truly important? See, he went back in time. These people could have proved themselves faithful, but instead they didn't. They proved themselves unfaithful. God's not going to let them soar like eagles. In fact, they're going to crash and burn. And it will be a terrible loss. That reminds me of a parable Jesus told us. He said one day he's sitting there talking to his boys. He says, you know what? He who believes in me is like a smart man who built his house on a firm foundation. Then the storms came and the waves crashed against it and the lightning struck it and, and nothing happened to it. It was just fine. Oh, it wasn't easy. You know, life can be difficult sometimes. But in the end, it was just fine. He who believes in me is going to be okay. Oh, it's not always a bed of roses. It's not a walk in the park by any stretch of the imagination. This world is a horrible place. So you can succumb to the world or you can hang in there with me. Because I can tell you one thing for sure. The world might not change, but you're going to be okay. When all said and done. But the man who doesn't believe in me is a foolish man who built his house upon the sinking sand. And what happened? Well, the storms came just like the other guy. And the lightning struck and, the, you know, the waves crashed against it. And the fall was great. And Jesus puts a second emphasis in there. He says, and how great that fall was. The emphasis of that second verse means so great that it can't be restored. It can't be rebuilt. It's done. It reminds me of Noah. People partied. And Jesus references this in the gospel. Give us a sign and we'll believe. Jesus said, no sign will be given you except the one you already have in your own history. That's the sign of Noah. Well, what did Noah do? Noah didn't do anything. He was faithful. He built a boat. He built an aircraft carrier in the middle of the desert. And people laughed at him and made fun of him. Not just a week or two. 89 years or whatever it took him to build that thing. And the people partied and they carried on and they married and they got hammered and they did all this wonderful stuff in the world right up until the day the Lord shut the door of the ark. Remember, the door was so huge and massive, Noah couldn't close it. Right up until the day God shut the door of the ark. Well, not only could Noah not close it, but he couldn't open it either. And then the rains began to fall and the people probably pounded saying, let us in. Noah couldn't do that even if he wanted to. And we're told three times in three verses, all life outside the ark perished. All life. But all life in that ark came out to a new world. No one fell overboard. Nobody got washed overboard. Nobody was thrown overboard. Nobody died on board. All life came out to a new world. Hmm. What did, why, why did Noah live and the whole rest of everybody else perished? Only one thing. <clears throat> Noah built a boat. An aircraft carrier in the middle of a desert. The rest of the world said, what a need. Noah said, no, no. 
There's a tragedy coming. Okay? What's chapter 10 about? Faithfulness. With it, a single individual can soar like an eagle. Without it, an entire nation of even God's chosen will be destroyed utterly. Faithfulness. It's the most important thing you will ever know on this earth. Especially you young men that are just starting in your adult life. Faithfulness to your spouse. Faithfulness to your God. Faithfulness to your family. Faithfulness to your jobs. Anything and everything you do, be faithful. And do it as unto the Lord. Not man. And you're going to be okay. Alright? That's chapter 10, boys and girls. Let's get out of here.